Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Lorraine Day, Walter Brennan, and Tom Drake in Kentucky. Ladies and gentlemen, your guest producer, Mr. Mitchell Lyson. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Next week on Saturday, the 9th of June, all roads will lead, in spirit anyway, to Louisville, Kentucky, and the running of that great turf classic, the Kentucky Derby. Founded almost three quarters of a century ago and fed by the highest traditions of the track, the Derby is not only the nation's most popular sporting event, it's become an American institution. Its entries are a roster of the great names in the history of racing. War Admiral, Son of Man of War, Bubbling Over, Gallant Fox, and Whirl Away. The Derby is a living symbol of the competition and good sportsmanship Americans so dearly love. Our play tonight, Kentucky, from the studios of 20th Century Fox, is a saga of that rolling bluegrass country where the thoroughbred is king of the domain, where family pride and fierce tradition clash in a thrilling climax every year at Churchill Down. Starred in tonight's cast is Sally Goodwin, is the charming and versatile Lorraine Day. Also Walter Brennan, who brings to the airwaves one of his most distinguished screen impersonations. And finally, in his first appearance on this stage, we have Tom Drake, whose rise to stardom is one of Hollywood's most promising events. In a newspaper description of the very first Kentucky Derby, the stand reserved for ladies was described as, quote, one grand bouquet of beauty, unquote. The girls with their parasols appeared to the reporter as so many party-colored butterflies in the slanting rays of the sun. Yes, even then, Kentucky boasted of the fairness of its women. The same boast would hold true today. Except I'm sure that today's Kentucky beauties, like women all over America, depend more on Lux toilet soap beauty care than parasols to guard the loveliness of their complexions. Well, the lights go down in our theater, and the curtain rises on the first act of Kentucky. Starring Walter Brennan as Peter Goodwin, Lorraine Day as Sally, and Tom Drake as Jack Dillon. To tell this story properly, we should go back to the time it really started. The time of another war. The war between the North and the South. When a man named Dillon, leading a company of federal cavalrymen, rode up to Elm Tree Farm and ordered his men to seize every horse on the place. I'm telling you for the last time, Dillon, put my horses back in their stall. I ordered them to take them, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. But Kentucky's a neutral state, and our domain may be neutral, but you're not. I'll always be a southerner, Dillon. Are your orders to steal from civilians? To steal from your neighbors? Hurry with those mares, Barkley. Yes, Dillon. Those horses are thoroughbreds. Imagine those creatures in battle. Why, it'd be kinder to shoot them here now. I hate to do this, Goodwin. You ought to know that. And you won't do it. Not while I'm alive. You put my horses back, or by heaven. Down that gun. I'll kill you first. I'll... Captain Dillon. I'm... I'm all right. It's nothing. What about him? A good shot, Captain. Goodwin's dead. Dead? Where are you going, sir? Up to the house. Goodwin's wife is there and a little boy. I was once their friend... Now I've got to tell them I've killed him. And the horses, sir? That's what we're here for. Round them up. Yes, that was all a long time ago. But the little boy whose father was killed is still at Elm Tree Farm. He's an old man who never forgot to hate a Dillon or to love a racehorse. He is Peter Goodwin, and right now, as usual, he's in his stable looking at a horse. Right, Mr. Peter? Yeah, I'm afraid so, Mr. Mellish. It's a bold tendon, all right. Poor Claire won't be running this year. Yeah, here we were, counting on him for the Keeneland handicap. Yeah. Everything's been against us lately. Shut up, Mr. Mellish. Uh, yes, sir. Have him punch fired and turn him out to pasture. I'm sorry, Walt Claire. You just forget about racing for a while, son. Mr. Mellish, 
You seen Sally? Yeah, she said, tell you, she and her daddy was out for a canter. Well, let me know when she gets back. I'll be at the exercise trail. Yeah, I'll tell her. Said I'd let her ride Bessie's boy when we run those two-year-olds. Never should have promised her. Nothing's the matter with her riding, Mr. Peter. Of course there ain't, but who in tarnation asked you? And I know just what I'm doing, Sally. We stand a chance to make a fortune. But to take every cent we own, Dad, to gamble it on cotton. <laughs> you leave everything to me, honey. There's not a thing to worry about. But don't you think we should... Dad, look out! What? Around the ten, there's a car coming. Quick, get off the road. Are they blind? Can't they see it? Stay where you are, Sally. Don't move. You blasted idiot! Oh, if I only knew who it was. That was one of the Dillon cars. Dillon. It would be. Oh, well, let's get on home. Uncle Peter's going to run the coast. Please, Mr. Jack, leave me drive. Why, you didn't miss those folks by that much. Can't blame me for getting close to a girl that pretty. Who was she? Miss Sally Goodwin and her paw. Well, well. After five years from home, I've got a lot of catching up to do. But not at 70 miles an hour, Mr. Jack. Please. Oh, Son, five long years. I've missed you, boy. Two years in South America, two years in Canada, a year in England. But at last, I'm a free man. What do you mean? Well, I've learned all I want to about the banking business. Is that why you're home? You got fired? No, no, I quit. Oh, didn't it occur to you to consult me first? Sure, but I knew what you'd say. I see. Well, Jack, what do you want to do? Stay here. Dad, I was brought up on horses, and that's what I want. To breed them, train them, and race them. But that's a full-time job. That's exactly what I mean. Listen, son, I love horses as much as you do. But horses are a hobby, and banking is our business. Jack, couldn't you come into the bank here and work with me? But, Dad, I... I can get you on the board. That won't take all your time. Meanwhile, you can keep one eye on the horses, get a few for yourself, perhaps, and... Jack, we're all either of us has in the world. Surely we can work this thing out somehow. Well, if it means that much to you, Dad, sure. I'll give it another trial. Thank you, son. You'll never regret it. Now, tell me about the horses. Well, we've got just about the best stable we ever had. And how's Elm Tree doing? The good ones. Getting by. Old Peter's still alive. Hates us just as much as ever. Dad speculating in cotton. Better get smart, too, or he'll lose his shirt. He had a daughter, didn't he? I seem to remember a daughter. Oh, yes, Sally. You see her in town now and then, a real beauty. No use for us either? Oh, she and her father nod to me on occasion. Mr. Don, sir. What is it, Cleo? I done caught him again. Old Ben. Come in. Caught him in the smokehouse, Mr. John, with one of your best hands. Mr. John, you know I wouldn't steal nothing from you. Hey, what's happened to your head, Ben? Well, howdy, Mr. Jack. Oh, Lord, this woman done bust me wide open. Oh, I just laid a little piece of kindling wood against it. Ben, you've been stealing from us for years. Last spring it was a saddle. Oh, no, sir, no, sir. Last spring was the guinea hen. Time before was the saddle. <laughs> oh, oh, Ben. Trouble, trouble all the time. Now, don't start crying. That used to work, but not anymore. Now, get off this place and stay off. Yes, sir. Oh, Ben, go if you say so. Oh, Mr. Jack. I put up with him for years just because he was here in my father's time. But he'll really have to go this time. Pay him off, will you, Jack? Ben, wait a minute. Good out for soup for all my friends. Just the bowl. Is that money for me, Mr. Jack? And it's worth more than you are for a year. Thank you, sir. Looks like I got one friend left. Well, just mend your ways, you old sinner. Yes, sir. I'll go out and report, Mr. Jack. I'll give you my word. Come on, Jack. Let's take a look around. We've run enough, Mr. Mellish. Now have those swipes cool them coats off good. I'm real happy with the workout, Mr. Peter. Yeah? Well, just look at the track they've been running on. Why, it's hotter than my arteries. Doggone it, if I wasn't here, there wouldn't be a sound-legged horse on the place. Ah, the track's fine, soft as sand. Thoroughbred's got to run on a cushion. I've been telling you that for 30 years. Mm. Yes, sir. Yeah, just about. Well, they didn't do too bad out there, Mr. Mellish. No, not too bad. Come here, Sally. How'd they look, Uncle Peter? Never mind. I thought I taught you how to ride. Couldn't hold Bessie's boy in. He's got a mouth like iron. Darn you, girl. Bessie boy's got a mouth like a kitten. Yes. Well, 
Anyway, your clothes real pretty. Oh, Miss Sally, Miss Sally. Who is it? Miss Sally Sanderson. Oh, tell her I'll be right there. All this lunch, soup and grits and gravy. The doctor said you had to stay away from pork. I want pork chops. Do you hear? Two pork chops. No doctor's going to run my stomach. Yes, sir, Mr. Peter. Two pork chops. Dad? Yes, Uncle Peter? Now, guess what was it you were trying to tell me? That I'm afraid you'll have to wait for that new stable. We can't afford any building right now. No, but we can afford to gamble on cotton, can't we? Mm, buying cotton at these prices is no gamble. We'll be on Easy Street. There's only one house on Easy Street, son. That's the poor house. Oh, forget it, Uncle Peter, and eat your soup. That's what I'm doing. Jack, bust the buttons of a bobtail baboon trying to burn me to death. Oh, now the soup isn't that yeah, hot. It's hotter than the hinges of... Never saw such a place. <laughs> the smell out of a man. Sally, are you still uh, planning on going into town with me this afternoon? Oh, I'm sorry, Dad. I just promised Helen Pemberton I'd play some tennis. Guess who'll be there? Jack Dillon. Who did you say? Did you say Jack Dillon? Well, yes, I did. Is that him on the road this morning? It must have been. Helen said one reason he'd like to see me is to apologize. You ain't going, Sally. The Dillons are no good, and you let them alone. Uncle Peter, I know what they did to you, but, but that was so long I'm ago. I'm leaving the table, see? I'm finishing my lunch in the kitchen because I told you real polite what I think of the Dillons. And if I hear another word about them, I'll likely lose my temper. Uncle Peter, and you keep quiet. Lily! Yes, sir. I have my pork shops in here. Oh, Please, now may Dillon. I say something? Not to me if you're trailing around with a Dillon. Lily! Who are you talking to there? Huh? He said, please, can he have something to eat? Oh, who are you? Yes, old Ben, sir. Where are you from? The Thistle Ridge, sir. Worked for the Dillons going on 50 years, sir. But now the old me out. I ain't surprised, are you? Yeah. <laughs> you see what I mean, Sally? They just bust me over the head with a stick and let me go. Well, when you're through eating, go around the stables and tell Mr. Mellish I said to put you to work. Thank you, sir. Sally! Where are you going? To the telephone. I won't be meeting Jack Dillon this afternoon, or any other afternoon. They tell me Mr. Jack going to school the Dillon horses now. What happened? He's trying to get wise and quit. Mr. Slocum? Oh, no, So Mr. Jack just kind of helped Mr. Slocum. Getting ready for the big races at Keeneland. That come along pretty soon now, don't it, sir? Track opens Thursday. Say, you talk too much. Go on, eat your victuals. Yes, sir. England opening on Thursday. Without an elm tree horse. Yeah, but we'll be there just the same, Sally. Just to see what's running. Well, how am I doing, Bob? Is this tape job all right? Get any better at this, Jack, and I'll be looking for a new job. <laughs> well, it's a time and place to start looking. Opening day at Keelan. Say, Duckfoot's going to work out Captain Heather. I'd like him walk some first. Okay. And, oh, Jack. Yeah? I'm not so sure your father would want to see you doing this sort of thing. Oh, he knows where I am. That you're working in the stalls doing a swipes job? Look, I can handle my... Hey. Huh? Over there, looking at the horses. Oh, that's Goodwin's daughter. Yeah. And it's about time I met her. She finds out your name is... She won't find out. Yes, sir. Captain Heather, Sally Goodwin, and I are all going for a little walk. Yes, ma'am. How's he, Brad? The tramp out of tantrum by Storm King. Nice hips and shoulders. Close couple. Any use? Only fair, ma'am. He's running in the third. You training him? Well, trying to. I, uh, I've got some pretty good horses here for the meet. Like to look them over? But you're busy now, and I'm... No, glad to, glad to. Hey, Duckfoot. Yes, sir? Put this horse up. He's cooled out now. Cooled out? But he ain't been nowhere yet. Do as you're told. And tell Jack Dillon I'll see him later. Yeah. What you say? Oh, these stable boys. No idea of what's going on at all. Oh, these are our horses down this way, miss. Now, there's a nice filly. Wonderful. Good legs, nice hips and shoulders. Beautiful face. What? Oh, I was just saying she's going to beat some good horses before she's through. Whose string is this? John Dillon's. Oh. Something wrong? My name happens to be Goodwin. Goodwin? Oh, yes, yes, I did hear something about a feud or something. And take my advice and find another job. You can work 50 years for the Dillons and, 
and then they'll run you off just because you're old. The Dillons do that? Sally! That's you? Here, Uncle Peter. I thought I'd find you messing around the stable somewhere. Hmm. Nice little filly. Is she? She's a Dillon colt. Then what are you looking at her for? Let's get out of here. Thanks for the warning, miss. Where's Daddy, Uncle Peter? He's in the clubhouse. Said he had to meet somebody. Come on, honey. Let's look at some horses that ain't Dillon. You were looking for me. I was, Dylan. I'll uh, I'll come right to the point. I've been planning to drop in at the bank. Oh? There's no reason why you and I can't be at least civil. No reason in the world. Or do business together. I want to see about a loan on Elm Tree. Uh, if you'll fill out the usual application, the directors will take it up Monday. Thank you. Uh, by the way, my son is interested in some of your horses. He'd like to cross some of your King James blood with some of our Tampast mares. I wonder if you'd accommodate him. Uh, my uncle handles our horses. I'd have to get his consent. And we'd better forget about it. Oh, not necessarily. Uh, these dice here on the bar. If I rolled you dice and you won, uh, Peter wouldn't object to the payment of a gambling debt, and you'd own a King James horse. You see, I'd like to do you a favor. Unfortunately, I'm not a gambler. Oh, come on. One throw. The choice of any King James horse against any two-year-old of Thistle Ridge. Very well. Throw. A six and a three. A six and a five. Sorry, Dylan. You know my trainer, Bob Slocum. I'll send you a note. Bring it around to Slocum, and you can pick out your two-year-old. Thank you. And uh, about the loan? My board of directors will decide that. Uh, do you mind if I drop in at the bank on Monday? Not at all. Let's get down to cases, gentlemen. Does this bank loan Goodwin $50,000 or not? Goodwin's all right with me. Understand he has to have money fast or he'll lose Elm Tree Farm. Then let's give it to him. It's my opinion that the loan should be denied. Yes, but, Dad, why? There's already one mortgage against Elm Tree. Goodwin wants this money to cover his speculations in cotton. But we can't see Elm Tree ruined. I think we understand that point of view, Jack. We won't take up the board's time discussing it. Wait a minute, Dad. Are we denying this loan because Goodwin is a gambler or because his name is Goodwin? Are you suggesting there's anything personal in my attitude? I'm sorry, Father. Gentlemen, you know you would have granted this loan until my father stopped you. I move we waive his objections. Give Goodwin the money and save Elm Tree. Well, this is all very distressing, but since the motion is made, we'd better take a vote. Very well. Gentlemen, shall we grant the loan? No. no. Thank you. The meeting's adjourned. Jack. Where are you going? Mr. Goodwin's waiting. I'll tell him the happy news. Where did Mr. Goodwin go, Miss Hill? Oh, he just stepped down the corner for a newspaper. Oh, oh, there he is. He's coming in now. I'll... Oh, Mr. Dillon, look. What's the matter with him? Oh, he looks as if he... He collapsed. Call a doctor quickly. <gasps> Jack, I was about to send for you. I wanted to see you, too. Jack, your conduct before the directors was most offensive. I'm sorry if I hurt you, sir, but I meant every word I said. You still think I refused Goodwin the money because I dislike him? Doesn't matter. He won't need the money now. Goodwin's dead. Dead? Yes, on the doorstep of this bank. He had this newspaper in his hand. You want to see the headline? Cotton nose dives to all-time low. Goodwin. Well, that's... Uh... That's terrible. He knew you wouldn't give him the loan. He told me so before the meeting. He's gone now, Dad. And Elm Tree is the next to go. A place that's meant more to Kentucky than this bank ever could mean. Is it my fault Goodwin threw his money away? No, Dad. You had your duty to think of just as your grandfather had his duty when he killed his good one. That'll do from you. I came home thinking this feud business was a gag. Something you see in the funny papers. It seems it's not so funny after all. You'd better go now before I forget you're my son. Yes, perhaps I'd better try to forget it myself. It, it seems like a bad dream, Uncle Peter. Something that we'll wake up from. Something we imagined while we were asleep. Mm -hmm. He goes... He dies, 
I still hang on. It just ain't right, Sally. It just ain't right. Poor Daddy. He tried as hard as he knew how to save Elm Tree. Got to go now, Uncle Peter. Farm, all the horses. I know, honey. I know. But we'll come back someday. We've got to come back someday. Pause for intermission before we return with Act Two of Kentucky. Hello, Sally. How nice you look. Fresh from the beauty parlor, Mr. Kennedy. Like the hairdo? Oh, wow, I'd call it. It's the very newest thing, Mr. Kennedy. All the girls are slicking their hair up tight and smooth like this for summer. It certainly looks cute piled on top of your head like that. Well, the trick is to pull it up very tight and bind it all together with a narrow ribbon or rubber band. Then you grasp the ends firmly... Comb them into curls or braid them into a coronet. You know, Sally, that certainly is the hairdo to show off a lovely luxe complexion. <laughs> That's what I thought you'd say, Mr. Kennedy. And it's perfectly true. When a girl brushes her hair up and away from her face like this, she's mighty grateful if her skin looks nice and clear. Well, there's one fashion that never changes, Sally, and that's a lovely, smooth complexion. A real luxe complexion. Daily active lather facials can help any girl to make her skin lovelier. Won't you describe how simple an active lather facial with Lux Toilet Soap is, Sally? Here's all you do. Cover your face generously with the creamy Lux Soap lather. Work it in thoroughly. Rinse with warm water, then splash on lots of cold. Now pat your face dry with a nice soft towel. And that's all there is to it. Thanks, Sally. Now, here's a Hollywood tip for women everywhere. Why not take these facials regularly and see what new freshness and beauty they'll bring? Recent tests showed actually three out of four complexions improved in a short time with this gentle care. Remember, Lux Toilet Soap contains only the finest ingredients. It's Hollywood's own beauty soap. Here's Mitchell Lyson and our stars. And now Act Two of Kentucky, starring Lorraine Day as Sally, Walter Brennan as Peter Goodwin, and Tom Drake as Jack Dillon. Within a week, there have been two funerals at Elm Tree Farm. The first was for Sally's father. The second, for a grand tradition. For today, the Goodwin property and the Goodwin horses were sold at auction. It's late at night now. Uncle Peter sits by a window watching a torrential downpour while Sally tries to explain what their new life will be. You didn't hear a word I said, did you? I... I heard. So we'll take that cottage near town, and we'll get along fine. It's small, so we won't need any servants except Lily. And I'm sure Mr. Mellish won't be out of work long. It's a regular cloudburst. We're going to lose some trees. Oh, darling, don't worry, so. At least we saved Bessie's boy. Bessie's boy. Someday, Sally, Bessie's boy is going to carry us back to Elm Tree. He's a wonderful colt. Oh, Uncle Peter, remember that man who showed me the Dillon horses at Keeneland? What about him? He was here today. He wants to work for us. Train Bessie's boy on a on a no-win, no-charge basis. You let him talk to you? He's just snooping around here for the Dillons. Oh, no, he's not working for them anymore. He said he'd had a row with Mr. Dillon. What's his name? Anderson. Jack Anderson, he said. He's coming back tomorrow. I, I said I'd speak to you. Oh, I can't think now, honey. Where are you going? Out to the stables. Uncle Peter, the stables are empty now. They ain't empty. They've been empty only once. In 1861. We still got our cold. Please, dear. Sally, I don't... I don't feel good. I'm sick. I just don't know what to do. Uncle Peter. Uncle... Lily! Lily, come here! Lily, come here! Oh, we've got to get a doctor, Mr. Mellish. We've got to. Uh, the car smashed to pieces, Miss Sally. That big old elm fell right on top of it. I'll try the phone again. Oh, it's no use, miss. Wires are all down. 
Oh, if we only had a horse, we Bessie's could... boy. Yeah. Miss Sally, you can't take Bessie's boy. We've got to get a doctor. But it's four miles on a concrete road. The hard pike will break her down, sure. Stay with Uncle Peter, Mr. Mellon. No, you can't ruin the best coat we ever raised. Mr. Peter, it's soon a die. I'll be back soon. <laughs> You'll be all right, Sally. Oh, thank goodness. It's just been the shock of everything. Sally! Yes, Uncle Peter? Oh, dear. There she goes. Please, try to rest. A little while ago, hoofs on the pavement, and I heard Bessie's boy, wasn't it? Yes, Uncle Peter. We ain't got a horse in the world now, Sally. We ain't got nothing. Except each other. Except each other. Oh, Mr. Anderson. Hello, Miss Goodwin. Won't you come in? Thanks. I'm sorry I couldn't see you last week, but Uncle Peter... He's better now? Oh, yes. Spry as ever. Sally! Who's at the door? I see what you mean. <laughs> Who is Uncle oh. Peter, this is Mr. Anderson. Oh, you want to train Bessie's boy, huh? That's right, sir. Well, you and nobody else will ever train Bessie's boy now. He ain't got a sound leg on him. But what's happened? He ran four miles in eight minutes on a concrete road. That's what happened. The night of the storm, we, we had to get the doctor. We'll have to decline your offer, Mr. Anderson. Unless, of course, we get one of the Dillon's two-year-olds. Now, don't start that nonsense You see, Mr. Anderson, I found a note signed by Mr. Dillon giving my father the choice of any two-year-old at Thistle Rig. Could I... could I see it? Here. Uh, Dillon wouldn't give away a yellow dog. Thaddeus Goodwin is entitled to his free choice of any two-year-old at Thistle Ridge Farm. John C. Dillon. Yes, that's my... Uh, that's Mr. Dillon's handwriting, all right. I think you ought to look into this, sir. I got what? Only mentioned Staddy is good. And he's gone now. That's all the room a Dylan needs to squirm out of a deal. You don't think he'd welch on an obligation, do you? Well, I'll bet my Sunday shirt he'll try. Then we're going, Uncle Peter. Yes, I reckon so. Well, they've got they've got one two year old over there named Hold on there. <laughs> I do my own picking. You can take advantage even of a Dylan. Do you mind if I drop by a little later? I'm sure, if you like. Son, I didn't mean to be short with you, but if there is a good coat at this would reach way, I'm likely to find him. Any two-year-old, Mr. Dillon? You mean any two-year-old we've got? You heard me, Slocum. They're to have their choice. They're on their way to the stables now. What if they pick Postman? If they do, they get him. You understand? Yes, sir. Hey, Marty. Yeah. The old man's gone out of his head. He's given the good ones their choice of our two-year-old. Get down to the exercise track. When Postman's cooled off, put him in the track shed and keep him there, you understand? Well, sure. And take that little black coat along. He's got lots of promise. Keep him in the track shed, too. All right, get going. Well, Mr. Gooden, you've seen them all, and this filly here is the sweetest trick of the lot. Uncle Peter, she's a beauty. Oh, well, the horse racing the beauty contest. Well, uh, what about the chestnut? She's curbed, sucks. She'll die of old age and never know she's got her. <laughs> She'll die of old age before we own him. He's already good? Yep, you've seen races. them all. What's that? What's what? That's Ain't singing. Oh, oh, just one of the swipes, I guess. Mr. Goodwin, I'd like to make you a proposition. Now, wait a minute. That swipe's wearing jockey silks. He's just off the exercise track. Ain't you, Mr. Slocum? Well, I, I really couldn't say. I, you know, Nick, the horse racing, Mr. Slocum, I love singing bed. Excuse me. Where's he at? Where's he at? Over in the track ship. Over in the track ship. Over at the track ship now. And what's he called? What's he called? Going to the races now. Name of postman. Name of postman. Going to the races. Going well, to... Brother Slocum. Yes, sir. I reckon Miss Gooden uh, and I'll ramble over to the track shed. Well, this is a coat that worked a half in 48, huh? 
was posting, all right. Maybe he did. Uncle Peter, just look at him. Mm-hmm. Can't fault him with a microscope. But you know, I'm sort of taking a fancy to my little black friend over here. Slocum, put the black coat in the truck. Yes, sir. The black coat? You heard me. Oh, now, wait a minute. Now, listen, girl. I can count the great horses I ever seen on the fingers of one hand. Every one of them had the same look in his eye. And you can't beat the horse with that look. And this here coat's got it. The look of eagles. I'm sorry, Uncle Peter. But it, it's my horse and, and it's my choice. I choose Postman. Sherry, it's kind of late in the day for you to go back on me. Uncle Peter, it's just that... Don't you think I know what I'm doing, honey? Well... We'll take the black coat, Mr. Slocum. He's a fine-looking colt, Miss Goodwin. But I had hoped you'd pick Postman. We're lucky to have any after the trick Mr. Dillon tried to pull. Trick? He had Slocum hide him out. Postman, too. Mr. Dillon did that? Yeah, maybe you worked for Dillon, but you sure didn't learn much about him. Well, do you still want to train for him? Do I? Take him. He's yours. Here. Thanks. Well, when you two get through holding hands, maybe we can find a name for him. Well, he belongs to real Kentuckians now. Call him Bluegrass. Might make him grow some. Bluegrass. Of course, that's it. Oh, I went over to Chandler's while I was waiting. He said we could use... I'm talking to you. Uh, yeah, yeah. I've been trying to talk to you since yesterday afternoon. I saw Bluegrass work out. Mm, that's nice. And he is a good horse, but he just hasn't got speed. He wants you might more time. Time? We've had him now for five months. Maybe we need a new trainer. Jack's brought him along beautifully. Gee, is that today's paper? Yes, and listen to this. Postman wins Crescent City Handicap eased up. Mm-hmm. Good call. Dylan's great horse takes New Orleans Classic for his fifth straight win. Well? Lily! Yeah! Bring me an apple. I'm not finished. Postman's performance today is sure to make him a heavy favorite for the Kentucky Derby. Oh, Uncle Peter, if you'd only admit you were wrong. I was wrong about a horse once. Let me see. Uh, that was in 1901. Here's your apple. I picked out a nice soft one. And see that you take this tonic, too. You will kindly take that witch's brew and run it down the drain. Postman. Five. Three. Three. These dang apples are growing hotter every oh, year. Oh, you, you, you're just, you're Trying just. I wish you had a few more teeth hey, in there. Come in, Jack. Oh, Sally, Mr. Peter. Look, I haven't touched it. It's just the way I clicked them in. I haven't touched what? This, the stopwatch. See what it says? One minute, 37 seconds. Sure, bluegrass, 137. How far? Seven furlongs? A full mile, wire to wire. A mile? Oh, but he couldn't. But he did. Hmm, picked the wrong horse, uh, did I? Uncle Peter, how did you know? Hey, get away from me. Don't hug me. Hug him. He's the fellow who did it. <laughs> well, sir, bluegrass about ready for a prep race for the derby, son. You better enter him. I already have. He'll run on Thursday. Sally, what's the matter? The derby? With postmen in those eastern coasts? Oh, don't be silly. Oh, I don't think I am. Sally. Yes? I... Look, this all means a lot to you, doesn't it? I mean, another good one horse in the derby and everything. Yes, it means a lot. Sally, you won't be sorry, whatever happens, that you let me train bluegrass. You've been wonderful. But there's something you've got to find out sooner or later, and I don't know how to say it. Do you have to say it? Sally, I... I... Jack, if you don't kiss me, I most certainly am going to kiss you. Oh. Now, what were you going to tell me? Oh, I, I, I just can't, Sally. I'm sorry, but I've got to get to the track by sunrise, so if you don't mind, I think I'd better run along. Jack. I'm taking bluegrass to Keeneland. Oh, and of course, I couldn't interfere with that. Oh, it, it's not that. You it's... know, you're not the easiest person in the world to understand. Well, if I... Bye. Bye. Was there anything in your life that ever meant more to you than a horse? Certainly not. 
Well, there is in mine. A little while ago, I practically threw myself at him. He left me flat. Now, listen to me, Sally. Jack's training a court that starts in the Derby two weeks from today. And if any girl could keep his mind off of that, I wouldn't give a nickel for him. I might have known better than to come to you for sympathy. You don't need sympathy. You own bluegrass. He's running his first race Thursday, and he's going to win it. Except you and I won't be at Keeneland to see him do it. What are you talking about? Darling, you know what the doctor said about excitement. Oh, maybe you're right. What? It won't be a race anyway. Bluegrass will walk away. But we could drive over the club, maybe, and make a bet and listen to the race on the radio, couldn't we? Well, yes, I guess we could do that much. <laughs> Give me your money. But suppose Jack isn't trying with Good when the horses are always trying. Well, at least let me telephone Jack and see what he says. Go ahead. I'll hold the money. And Go don't on. you bet till I come back. <laughs> yeah. Hundred dollars on bluegrass. Lots aboard? On the nose. Okay, Grandpa. That goat stagger's home, you'll own this place. And the first thing I'll do is fire you. Hello. Uh, is this Keeneland? Trainer's booth. Hello, uh, this is Sally Goodwin. I'd like to speak to my trainer, please. Sorry, miss. Can't send for a trainer just before a race. Oh, please. Uh, I have to speak to Mr. Anderson. It's very important. Mr. Anderson? Yes, at Bluegrass. There's no Anderson here. But I tell you, I'm Sally Goodwin, and my trainer is Jack Anderson. Now, wait a minute, sister. John C. Dillon Jr. is training Bluegrass, and if he's been handing you a line, don't tell it to me. Tell it to a lawyer. Goodbye. John C. Dillon Jr. Excuse me. Excuse me. Get up to that uh, loud speaker. <laughs> Around the first turn, it's Palisades on the rail by two lengths. Airplane is second. Hurry on is third and high voltage. Moving up fast. You don't worry. Just laying off the pace. Turning for home. It's Palisades in front and going well in hand. Airplane is second by a length and a half. High voltage is third and responding to pressure. What's happened to your long shot, Grandpa? <laughs> Into the stretch. It's Palisades by two lengths. Airplane by a length and a half. High voltage by and on the outside. Closing very fast is Bluegrass. Just a gallop. Come on, baby. They're coming down to the line of finish now. It's Palisades and Bluegrass. Palisades and Bluegrass. It's going to be a driving finish. They're head and head. Now they're coming across the line and Palisades win by a nose. Bluegrass in second and airplane in front of high voltage. That race was crooked. <laughs> Uncle Peter. Look at I tell you. It doesn't matter. Let's get out of here. Your attention, please. Your attention. Foul claimed at Keeneland. There. You see? I told you so. The judges have sustained a claim of foul. Palisades has been disqualified. And the winner of the race, Bluegrass. You never fooled me for a minute. And you. Yes, sir. $2,100, please. Be right with you. Uncle Peter. You could have won eased up if they hadn't fouled him. What's the matter with you? I just had Keenan on the phone. His name isn't Jack Anderson. It's John C. Dillon Jr. What? Who, who told you they that? Told Dillon. Another dirty lion, Dillon. Why did he do it? Why? Why? Oh, ain't it plain enough? We're racing against Postman in the Derby. He'll see to it that we don't beat him. But he wanted to train for us before we owned Bluegrass. Sure, sure. Whatever coat we had, he was going to get him beat. Oh, I don't believe it. I, I can't believe oh, it. Oh, come on, honey. We get some tall thinking to do. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. We'll be back with the third act of Kentucky in a moment. And now, a homecoming husband. Hi there. Where's my sweetheart? Janie. Down in a moment, darling, soon as I get the baby tucked in. Why don't you go ahead with your bath? The water's all drawn. 
I put a clean towel on the rack, and there's a nice new cake of Lux soap. Oh, what a wife. What a sweetheart. Janie, you think of everything. Yes, Jane has an adoring husband. And why not? Jane's a thoughtful wife. She thinks of little things, important little things. She knows that nothing builds up a man's morale after a hard day like a good hot bath with a soap that lathers. Ah, nothing sissy about this lather. Really gets you clean. Men go for the rich, extra creamy lather Lux Toilet Soap gives. Active lather that carries away every trace of the day's dust and grime in a jiffy. And from the housekeeper's point of view, here's something else that's important. Lux Toilet Soap is so thrifty. It's hard milled. Each cake can be used to the last little sliver. That's why I can afford to buy it as a family bath soap, too. Why not treat your family to fine white Lux Toilet Soap for their daily baths? They'll enjoy the refreshing lather. Creamy and rich, even in hard water. A quality soap, Lux Toilet Soap, at a very little price. Back now to our play and Mitchell Lyson. Act Three of Kentucky. Starring Walter Brennan as Peter Goodwin, Lorraine Day as Sally, and Tom Drake as Jack Gillen. The following afternoon, and back in town, Jack Gillen hurries straight to the Goodwin home. But in the pasture, adjoining the cottage, he sees something that brings him to a sudden startled halt. Better stay where he is, Mr. Jack. Why, that's bluegrass. What's he doing here? Mr. Peter, give me the shotgun. He said he'd come around this here horse. Now, but I left him at Churchill Downs last night. Yes, and Mr. Peter and Miss Sally, they didn't fox him back home. They say no Dylan Polk had gone train a Goodwin horse. Oh, so she found out. Man was Mr. Peter's steamer. He said he'd gone to train him himself till after the derby. Didn't, didn't Miss Sally say anything? Yes, sir. Here. She said, tell you, here's your share of yesterday's winning. She says she don't blame you now, neither, for changing your name from Dylan. Well, that's that. Are they at the house? No, sir. That's why I was spelling Mr. Peter with a shotgun. When will they be back? Well, that I don't rightly know, sir. But I did hear Miss Sally say something about a dance tonight over Miss Helen Templeton. Well, thanks, then. I'll be there, too. Fine friend you are, Sally. Why didn't you tell me your horse was going to run? <laughs> Believe me, it was all very sudden. Well, at least I can prove my loyalty to you. I'll keep your bet small, my boy. He's a small horse. Now, look, a bluegrass car ain't going to cut in. Oh, hiya. Sure, thanks, Sally. It was swell. I'm not dancing, Mr. Dillon. Oh, Sally, please. I'm sorry you found out the way you did. I wanted to tell you myself the other night. Then I decided to wait until after the derby because the bluegrass won. Well, you'd have to believe me. Don't you understand? It doesn't matter. I came here to talk to you, and that's just what I'm going to now, do. Look, Dylan, I wouldn't use that tone with Miss Goodwin. I don't like it. I don't care whether you like it or not. Tom, please, I'll, I'll see you later. I'd like to see him later, too. Everybody's looking at it. Come on, let's get out of here. All I want to do, Sally, is explain why I didn't tell you who I am. Isn't it obvious? To make sure we don't beat Postman in the dirty? You really believe that? Well, what other reason could there be? Because I wanted to be with you, to help you. And what chance did I have as a Dylan? All right, you've explained it. No, no, wait. You might as well know this, too. When your father asked for a loan at the bank and my father turned him down, he had something of a row. I haven't spoken to him since. Doesn't that prove something? Yes, the Dylans can't be decent even to each other. About Bluegrass. He's a great colt. He can win the Derby. Just tell your uncle he wants a hand ride all the way. I think Uncle Peter will know how to have him ridden. I know, but be sure and tell him that Bluegrass sulks if you use a whip. Tell him not to use a whip under any circumstances. Is that all? Yes, except that I love you. But I think you know I do. And even if it was a dirty trick, all that lying and pretending, at least to let me be near you for a while. So I can't be sorry no matter what happens or what you think. Good night, Sally. So it's you. Who in thunder shit I needed a doctor? It's just a routine examination, Uncle Peter. Dr. Nelson wants to find out if you're well enough to... 
Well, to stop taking the tonic. Get out of here, Doc. Now, now, Peter. No food doctor's examining me on Derby Day. With all this excitement and everything, well, we just want to be sure that nothing... Now, listen to me. For more than three quarters of a century, horses have been my life. Nothing else ever mattered very much. Just horses and this... this fool female here. And I won with Sheridan, too. And every time I did was because my boy rode like I told him. Oh, yes, sir. Now you lay back around fifth place till you cover the far turn. Then you make your move and keep a riding. Okay, Mr. Goodwin. Hey, look. Hit him a couple of licks at the eighth pole to wake him up. And if it's close, why, just fan him good. Oh, Peter, no. Don't use your whip ever. Bluegrass has got to be handwritten. What's that? Well, if you hit him, he sulks. You ride like I told I'm you. I'm sorry, Uncle Peter, but he's my horse, and, and this race means more to me than more than anything in the world. That Dylan's been talking Uncle to Uncle Peter, he knows bluegrass. Yeah, you turn against me to let a Dylan pull another dirty trick. He wouldn't do that. He wouldn't. Well, whose orders do I follow? Don't use the whip under any circumstances. Okay, miss, if that's the way you want it. Well, i better get him out there. Uncle Peter. Oh, Uncle Peter, I... I got nothing more. Now you better sit down, Jack. They're coming on the track. Hello, Slocum. You still got time to place the bet on bluegrass? That runt won't know which way Postman went. I'm telling you, Slocum, that black colt can fly. You on the level? Certainly. That's great. That's just fine. What? I mean that if it hadn't been for a no-count stable hand, old Goodwin never would have got him. So it was you who tried to hide him out. Well, they were just over at the track shed, and I figured Where's that I'd Where's my father? Him in his box. But listen, Jack, I was only trying to save you. Shut up and start looking for a new job. Hello, Dad. Jack. Oh, Jack, come in. Dad, I just found out a minute ago what a fool I made of myself. I'm sorry. That's all right, son. And that day at the bank, I... I guess I just lost my head. Perhaps we've both been a little too hasty. I think maybe from now on we'll be a little more understanding of each other. Dad, all these months I've been away, it's been because of what I thought you did to the good ones. But I was just talking to Slocum and I... We're all getting in there. We could have a start any second now. Peter, sit down. Sit down. Look yonder. Where? So oh. Dylan told you he wasn't speaking to his father, huh? Girl, you've just lost us the Jim. Hell, there they go. Daddy's got to win it for them, for Sally, for Mr. Peter, and for me, too. Well, they could get Elm Tree back if he should win. Oh, it's much more than that, Dad. I think I know what And now the back stretch now is Southman taking the lead. Evergreen is second by two lengths. Thunder Cloud is third by half a length, and Postman. It's Evergreen in front. Luke Rats on the outside is fifth, and now moving up. Around the far turn, it's Southman in front by one length. Evergreen is second, Thundercloud is third, and Postman is now making the move. It's Postman third and coming very fast. Blue Grass is fourth, and here comes Blue Grass. Look at him, Uncle Peter. Look at him come. Yeah, of course he's coming. He ain't going to get much further, though. Poor little horse. He needs a whip to tell him what to do. Standing for home, it's Evergreen in front of Postman. Evergreen and Postman. Evergreen and now it's Postman going to the front and responding to the whip. Bluegrass on the outside is now third and closing ground. Now he's second behind Postman. It's Postman and Bluegrass. Go to the whip! Go to the whip! Bluegrass! 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 Into the stretch, it's Postman and Bluegrass. Neck and neck, Postman and Bluegrass. Postman is responding to pressure. He's taking the lead now by a half a length. Bluegrass is second, and now Bluegrass is going to the whip. Throw that whip away! Throw it away! Please, 
Please don't use the whip. Throw it away. Drop your whip. We've won, Uncle Peter. We've won. Greatest little coat I ever saw. The look of eagles. That's what he's got. The look of eagles. Come on, Uncle Peter. We've got to get down there for the window. The look of eagles. Blue glass is being read into the winner's circle now, and this Charlie Goodwin, his owner, will decorate him shortly with a wreath of roses, emblematic of his triumph in America's greatest racing classic. Sally. Sally. Jack, we won. We won. Sally, darling. What's the matter? Mr. Goodwin? Yes. You ready? I I'm just waiting for my uncle. He won't be here, Sally. Won't be here. Will Mr. Peter Goodwin come to the winner's circle, please? Mr. Peter Goodwin. I was just up at your box, Sally. Uncle Peter, he... He's won his last race. Oh, no. No. Better come along now, darling. The services are about to start. I'm ready. You've worn up wonderfully. There's really no reason for fear. He died the way he wanted to. And now he can rest it. Down the street forever. There is very little that anyone can say at a time like this. But I feel that here in the earth we love so well. We are very more than a man. Jack, it's, it's your father. Yes, darling, he... He asked if he could just say a word. We're burying a phase of American life. In this day of automobiles and airplanes, many of us have forgotten the horse, what he meant to America. Not so with Peter Goodwin. He loved his horses with a lifelong devotion. And it was his great privilege, one which all men may envy, to die at the moment of his greatest triumph with the colors of his beloved elm tree once more riding to victory in a Kentucky Derby. I knew him but slightly, but of him I knew much, and nothing that did not do him honor. Jack. Yes, darling? I can hear him saying it now. A good finish. It's been a good finish. It's win, place, and show for the stars of Kentucky, Lorraine Day, Walter Brennan, and Tom Drake. You know, if we were at Louisville, I'd put a wreath of flowers on each of you. Well, thank you, Mitch, but you'd better have a special wreath for Walter. He won an Academy Award for his performance in this picture. Yeah, I know he did. How does it happen you get so many roles in racing pictures, Walter? You must have a real feeling for horses. I had quite a lot of feeling the first time I rode one, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Walter, Tom means you must be pretty fond of horses. Well, they, they got brains. They say there'll be 70,000 people come to see the horses at the Derby. Now, you'd never get 70,000 horses to watch a bunch of people race. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us, Walter, how are you at picking winners? Oh, pretty good. I'd settle for Lorraine right now. Lorraine wins by a nose, eh? Wins by a whole face. Uh, <laughs> I see what you mean, but it's that Lux complexion, among other things. Well, in that case, Mitch, you can put that wreath of flowers on Lux toilet soap. It's a champion for anybody's money. I think, Walter, Mr. Lyson was talking about horses. Did you ever pick a winner at the track? I picked a horse once, and as he passed the stands, I had to yell at him, Hey, they went that way! <laughs> and I suppose you thought he'd win in a walk. Oh, no, the walking was his own idea. Uh, then you haven't any system, Walter, you can recommend? For betting? Well, I'll tell you, Mitch. Best thing is to put a dollar on a horse's head and a dollar on its tail, and then you'll win no matter how it comes in. <laughs> well, speaking of picking winners, Mitch, what have you picked for Lux next week? Oh, next week, next Monday night, we have something rather special in both play and cast. 
It's the picture that brought to the American screen that distinguished actress Ingrid Bergman. She appears in her original role, co-starred with Joseph Cotton. In that... Co-starred in that stirring drama, Intermezzo. A musical genius caught in a fateful triangle of love provides the basis for one of the screen's most gripping and unusual stories. Well, even for the world's biggest theater, Mitchell, that's a big event. Good night, Mitch. Good night. Good night. You gave a champion performance in Kentucky. This week, America salutes the Army Air Force's Air Transport Command for its four years of vital service in supplying our frontline troops, transporting military personnel, and evacuating wounded over the greatest airline system in the world. To the 200,000 men and women of the Air Transport Command, we send our deepest thanks and our warmest wishes. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting to you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Ingrid Bergman and Joseph Cotton in Intermezzo. This is Mitch Lyson saying good night from Hollywood. The end of the war in Europe has relieved some military shortages but not a critical shortage of fats and greases. These must come largely from your kitchens. Keep on saving every precious drop of waste fats, regardless of how discolored. Strain fats into a clean can. Brush them to your butcher. He'll give you two additional meat ration points plus four cents for each pound. Kentucky, from a story by John Tainter Foot, was presented through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox, producers of the Technicolor production, Where Do We Go From Here? Mitchell Lyson's next picture to be released for Paramount is Kitty. Lorraine Day appeared through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of Valley of Decision. Walter Brennan will soon be seen in Warner Brothers' Stolen Life. Tom Drake is currently featured in the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer picture, This Man's Navy. Heard in tonight's cast were Howard McNear, Norman Field, Herb Rawlinson, Leo Cleary, Arthur Q. Bryan, Haskell Coffin, Ed Emerson, Horace Willard, Ruby Dandridge, Earl Smith, Lillian Randolph, Charles Seal, Eddie Marr, Robert Cole, Hal Dawson, Truda Marson, and Ralph Lewis. Our music was directed by Lewis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Intermezzo with Ingrid Bergman and Joseph Cotton. Stop! Pull that measuring cup, lady. Be sure your precious hard-to-get sugar is invested, not wasted. Do all your baking the sure way, the spry way, for dependably light, velvety-rich cakes, tender, flaky pastry. For all your cooking, be sure of success. Get pure, all-vegetable shortening at its creamy best. That's spry, S-P-R-Y. Be sure to listen in next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Intermezzo with Ingrid Bergman and Joseph Cotton. This is...